give thanks to the Lord and call on God's name. We will, we will praise our God and tell of all God's wonderful works. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We will give glory to God's holy name. Seek the Lord, God's strength and presence continually. We will remember God's mercy and justice in worship and praise. Let us pray. God of the past, present and future, we marvel at the wonder of your creation. We praise you for the blessings of this season, for gardens growing, birds singing, shouts of joy in times of play and restful evening sunsets. Such good gifts all around us remind us of your faithfulness to us. You promise us a life beyond anything we can hope or imagine, a kingdom marked by grace, love, and justice for all. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit breathing within us, we praise you for your loving kindness and the hope it brings to us day by day. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation, and on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy, for the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. And now the Collect for the Eighth Sunday of Pentecost. God of eternal wisdom, you alone impart the gift of discernment. Grant us understanding hearts so that we may choose wisely between the treasures of your promised reign and this world's counterfeits through Jesus Christ, the pearl of true value. Amen. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within the large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. 
And now we read God's plan of salvation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with all the spiritual blessings of heaven. God chose us in Christ before the world was made to be holy and blameless and to live by his love in his presence. God planned through Jesus Christ to bring us to himself as his children, that we might praise the glory of his grace, his free gift to us in the beloved. In Christ we gain redemption. Through his blood our sins are forgiven. How rich is the grace of God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this morning, in our reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, I find myself listening to what is perhaps my favorite passage of Scripture. It is a passage which speaks to me theologically. It speaks to me pastorally, and I believe gives us the most magnificent statement of faith that we will find anywhere in scripture. Um, so if you got about an hour and a half, just buckle up and, and I, I can start to talk about it just a little bit. Uh, one of the things I have been reading quite a bit about lately is the thought that in Paul's letter to the Romans, that what we have uh, really from chapter four through to the end of chapter 8, is echoes of the Exodus story. Um, the Exodus story, as you know, was the defining story of the people of Israel. The story that we see in, in Romans, the story of Christ and, and the Christian community, is the defining story of what is for Paul a reconstituted people of God. Um, for, the, for the Exodus story, it, it was Moses who through his pestering and, and through all of the plagues that were sent to the Egyptians managed to redeem God's people and, and, and get them out of slavery in Egypt. And, and for the reconstituted people of God, it was the life and, and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which set them free 
from slavery to sin. For the Exodus story, it took enormous faith for that people fleeing Egypt to pass through the roiling seas of, of, of the Red Sea and make their way to freedom. For Paul, it is the faith that allows people to pass through the waters of baptism that makes them part of that new constituted, reconstituted people of God. And, and, and for, for the people who followed Moses out of Egypt, they didn't just leave Egypt and suddenly find themselves in the promised land. They left Egypt and Moses led them through the wilderness, through the between times, between their freedom from Egypt and their entry into the promised land. And in the story we have today, we see that, that the church in Rome, the church in Rome were living very much in between times, in between the freedom won by Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God. And, and just as the people of Israel had Moses to lead them through the Sinai, through, through their between times, so we hear that the spirit, the advocate, is leading God's people through the between times before the kingdom of God is fully established. Whether all of that is true or not, I don't know, but it makes a great deal of sense to me. I can see the parallels. But from that point, we move to Paul speaking as a pastor. And we need to remember that for that fledgling Christian community in Rome, they were living under the rule of perhaps the most powerful and most violent imperial system the world had seen. And as a faith community, they were witnessing to and proclaiming Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus as Lord, Jesus as the Son of God in the very city where Caesar lived, in the very city where Caesar, who had those very same titles applied to him, held sway. Their future was uncertain. Their present was a present of suffering. And that's what we hear Paul addressing in the letter today. And, and he doesn't diminish it at all. I mean, he names the suffering. L listen to what he says. He recognizes, first of all, that in the midst of suffering and pain and, and fear and uncertainty, there come those moments when things are so bad we don't even know how to pray. There come those moments when we feel cut off from God. There come those moments when we feel abandoned. There come those moments when we feel frightened. And Paul reminds them he reminds them that when those moments come, remember that the Spirit, the Advocate, is with you. The Spirit will give you words, and if you can't find the words, the Spirit will intercede on your behalf. The strength you need, the hope you need, the comfort you need is going to come to you from the Advocate. And then, then he names it. And he's saying, listen, I know it's hard, but listen, will hardship or, or, or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, will any of those things, will any of them separate you from the love of God? And when he asked those questions, that list, those were all things they were experiencing. And he's saying to them, will what you are suffering day after day after day separate you from God's love? And the answer was no, no, no. And now listen to this. This is to me the most extraordinary, extraordinary statement of faith in the Bible. When Paul says, listen, I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nothing, nothing, nothing in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Christ as the new Adam gave the world a new beginning, a new opportunity to get it right. Christ as the new Moses set God's people free from the slavery of sin and free from the power of imperial systems. But the message to them was that if all of that glorious, glorious future doesn't come before you die, you need to know that as part of the new constituted Israel, as a child of God, you are also an inheritor of eternal life. If this does not come before you die, you will be in a place where there's no pain or suffering or hatred or violence. You will be in a place where you are with God and in God and surrounded by love and joy and peace. And my brothers and sisters, that's a win-win any way you look at it. Okay, I, I believe that as Paul was speaking to that church in Rome, I believe he was speaking to every man and woman who ever lived. Because in this passage, what he describes is the human condition. God's creation is magnificent. God's world is beautiful. Our life is a gift from God. But life can be hard. Life can be hard. And, and when you look at that list of things that, that Paul traces out for every human being that ever lived, you're going to experience some of that and for some, all of that. It's part of being human. And, and, and let's look at that list again because, folks, I think we're living it I think we're living it right now. Who or what will separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship. Listen, we're living with a pandemic. We're living with job loss. We're living with isolation. We're living with the fear of, of, of going out of our house. Distress, my God, if you're not distressed right now, living in this country, living at this time, good for you, you're stronger than I will ever be. Persecution, we're living in a time when people are persecuted for their gender, for their sexuality, for their religion, or the color of their skin. And we're seeing it come into our homes on television and through our devices day after day after day. Persecution is part of what we are living with in this country and in the world. Famine. Certainly in parts of the world we're dealing with famine. Uh, there was the threat of famine at the beginning of the pandemic. People began to hoard food and toilet paper. People were getting into fistfights in grocery stores over toilet paper and can of beans. And, and today, while the hoarding is not there, as people deal with the economic consequences of what we're facing, the ability for families to put food on the table is becoming more and more difficult. Peril. I feel in peril every time I walk out the door and go to the grocery store. I feel in peril every time I find myself in the midst of a crowd. Nakedness, I, I, I'm not thinking in this case of the people who feel that they don't have to dress to go to work when they're working in front of their computer, but I see nakedness as being about fear and vulnerability. Fear and invulnerability is part of living with COVID. Violence, it's all around us. 
But if we listen to Paul, if, if we listen to Paul and take him seriously, we know that we are not alone in this, that the Spirit, the Advocate, is with us to give us strength to help us cope if we trust. Now, let me, let me speak personally, and I, I don't know about you, but I know for me that at the most difficult times in my life, in the darkest moments in my life, in those moments when for me, depression or despair or fear or uncertainty had taken control. When I didn't know how to put one foot in front of the other, in those moments in my life when I didn't have the words to say in prayer and I feel cut off and abandoned from my God, there were people who came into my life and who shone the light of love into the darkness of what I was feeling. People who came into my life and gave me a glimpse of a future without pain, a future in which I could laugh and live again. People who came into my life, I believe, as advocates sent by God, who gave me comfort, who gave me strength, who gave me hope, who gave me love, and who gave me peace. I think that's what Paul's talking about in this letter. The ability to carry on, the ability to live, the ability to endure, the ability to make it from one day to the next without being overcome or overwhelmed by the things that are around us. What I'm going to ask you to do right now is to think about the difficult times in your life. Think about the times that you hurt. Think about the times that perhaps you suffered loss. The times when you were feeling cut off from God, alone and possibly despairing. Think of the difficult times that you have had, and we've all had them. And, and now I want you to think about the people who were there for you. Think about the ones who came alongside you. Think about the people who gave you courage, who gave you comfort. Think about the courage who helped you to remember that God's love and God's presence was all around you. Think about them and, and thank God for them. And maybe, just maybe, when this service is over, you'll pick up your iPad and send an email or pick up the phone and call them and thank them in person. For the people who came into my life, most of you are watching me right now, and I want to say thank you. You touched my heart, and you changed my life. Now close your eyes for just a minute, and just listen. Who or what will ever separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship? Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. No. I am convinced. I am absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor 
depth nor anything else in all creation. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now together, we say the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Good and generous God, in Jesus Christ you came to us, promising, promising us life in abundance. We give you thanks today for the abundant gifts we receive in him, assurance of your love day by day, promise of mercy when we recognize our own failings, hope renewed when, we, when things seem bleak, peace that comes when we trust ourselves to your eternal keeping. These are the gifts that matter, O God. So for all the times we experience these gifts, we thank you in these moments of silence. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Generous God, the world is going through difficult times this summer. So we pray for all those whose lives seem empty of joy because plans have changed and friends seem far away, because hearts are filled with disappointment and loneliness, because sorrow and grief rise up each day. 
Support each one we name in this silence with your abundant compassion. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Generous God, so many things must be rearranged because of the pandemic and the pain of countless in our society, which has been revealed in recent weeks. We pray for those whose lives are empty of purpose and for those who do not know the respect of their neighbors because they are without work, because they face discrimination and are devalued in our communities, because they have made poor choices and cannot find a way forward. Support each one we name in this silence with your abundant mercy and show them signs of hope. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Generous God, we remember before you in silence those whose lives are empty of peace and hope because they struggle with illness or disability, because they are powerless in the face of violence, because old animosities rankle and opportunities for reconciliation are elusive. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Good and generous God, fill us with the energy and compassion of your spirit that we might reach out to those facing difficult times. May, be, may we become for them the same gift of hope and strength we have received from you. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And now, joining our prayers and praises together. We pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen.